Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Hey Ben, you know how everyone's always asking us to turn consoles into portables? Mm -hmm. I think it is finally time to do the Nintendo 64. Well, all right, I guess we can build this. So I'm thinking we can probably do it in three parts over three episodes. In part one, we'll break down the N64, see what's inside. We'll rewire the RAM expansion module. Remember how you needed that for some games? Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty difficult to rewire that. So we'll, we'll do that as soon as possible. Then we can unify the heat sink and work on a new power supply for it to replace the wall wart. Okay. Then in part two, we can work on the battery charging circuit so we can put some LiPos into the portable unit. We'll do an RGB mod to get the best possible picture out of the Nintendo 64. We'll miniaturize the controller, make it as small as possible, and then we'll rewire the cartridge slot at our right angle so everything is as small as possible. Then in part three, we'll take all of that, combine it together, and design and 3D print, or possibly CNC, a case, mm -hmm. and then do wiring and final assembly, and hopefully have a cool battery-powered N64 that everyone can enjoy. Portable, yeah. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, like I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Here are the parts that I want to use for the Nintendo 64 Portable. So we have this Nintendo 64 and we took this apart a while ago when we did our 64 or 32 bit wars. We talked about the components on this and how it compared to the PlayStation one. So we have a memory expander. Now the weird thing about the memory on this, it was RAM bus memory, which means it has to be terminated. So that's why there was a null pack inside of your N64. It was a RAM terminator. So you pull that out and then you put the extra RAM in. It might be a bit of a challenge because we have to um, mount this in such a way that it is small. So we're probably going to put it at a right angle. Got a couple of game cartridges here. These are the ones I could find. Wave race. And of course, da -da 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 -da. Yet another movie in which Sean Bean dies. Here is a disassembled Nintendo 64 controller. Now one thing weird about the N64, the analog stick, it did not use potentiometers, it actually uses rotary encoders. So hopefully it doesn't take up too much space. So I have this authentic Nintendo circuit board and then I bought this um, reproduction Nintendo 64 controller as well. So it's nice and new, but the guts might be a little different. So we'll take a look inside of this. And then finally, everyone's favorite, the Sony PS1 LCD. So actually what I wanna do first First here is take the screen apart. I think we use the same screen on the Dreamcast. We probably did. It's a good screen. And apparently they made enough of them because they're still not too difficult to find, even though now they're 16 years old. It's old enough to drive. Here are the insides of the PlayStation 1 LCD screen. Now this is a really great screen to use because you get everything you need. You have composite input, S-video input, and RGB input, and plus there's a built-in audio amplifier and buttons. How handy. Now one thing I've done in the past is I'll actually remove the CFL light. I don't know if I will this time, but we'll see how much power it consumes. So you power this with 7.5 volts. It actually uses the same kind of adapter as the PlayStation Nintendo prototype that we uh, took apart in a previous episode. So I'm gonna grab the pinout for this and then I'm gonna wire up an adapter so we can get RGB going from this board to this screen. All right, I've hooked the Nintendo 64 up to the PlayStation 1 screen. I'm just using composite for now, but we'll also try to get RGB working. All right, so I have 7.4 volts going into the LCD and then for now we'll just use the existing power brick for the Nintendo. I've read that you don't actually need the heat sinks on the GPU and CPU. That's what other modders have said. So I'm gonna take their word for it, unless they're trying to sabotage me, which is possible. All right, let's see what happens. Turn on the screen, turn on the Nintendo. Ah, there we go. Hey, where's the music? Yeah, that's weird, I don't hear the music. Do, do, do. Wow, look at those frame rates. Hello, I'm Sean Bean. I will clearly die. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna see what's wrong with the audio, and then what I'll probably do first for this project is try to add in the RAM extender. Oh, let's see what happens if, oh, we killed it. Let's try it with the RAM pack. 
great, it still works. So the N64 had four megabytes of RAM stock, which you can see right here. It's RAM bus, which means the RAM is on a bus. So you either had a Terminator pack, which says there's no more RAM in the bus, or you had an extra RAM chip, which gave you four more megabytes for all the resolutions. So of course we want this thing to handle DD Kong Racing and Donkey Kong Country and Perfect Dark and Conker's Bad Fur Day. So we're gonna build the RAM expansion into this. The next thing I'm going to do is try to remove this connector for the RAM expansion. Most everything on this board is surface mount, which is good and bad. If you take a look at this connector, most of the pins are on this side, and the only thing you have on this side are some mounting tabs. So let's take a look at the best way to do this. I'm going to crank up my iron to about 700 F because I'm an American. Okay, so I'm going to heat up the tab and I'm actually going to tilt this forward a little bit. And even though we haven't heated up the other side of it, we should get a little bit of play. See, right there, it just moved. Okay, and I'm going to wait, let the solder cool. Then I can let go and it'll stay where it was. Heat up, push, get a little movement, let cool, release, push, heat up, get a little movement, let cool, release. Now that we've got it a little bit of the way, I can use my solder wick and remove the solder and then we should have a separation between the tab and the PCB. One thing we can also do is take an X-Acto knife now. See, we had to move it mechanically just so there was enough of a gap. So it probably re-soldered itself, but if we heat it up, we should be able to get the knife under there. The solder won't stick to the stainless steel X-Acto knife blade. Okay, so we have the tabs loose on this side. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna use the rake method to remove this side. That's why I wanted to make sure the tabs were completely removed on the other side so I don't have to worry about it. So again, I'm gonna have my iron up quite a ways and I'm gonna just put a lot of solder on this. That's one thing about desoldering is, you know, it's like, oh, I'm removing the solder, but adding solder can make it easier to remove solder. It's kind of weird. It's kind of like having to be cruel to be kind. It's one of those kind of things. Okay, so now that I've heated it up, I'm gonna just do this. And the reason I'm doing this over and over so the solder maintains heat, but I'm also burning my thumb. So I'm gonna wedge it with something else. There we go. Shoot, I cut my nails the other day. One trick I do is if I have a nail that's long enough, I can, I can kind of push that against the hot surface and you know heat doesn't transfer through it very well, but I don't have any long nails at the moment. Long nails are gross. Ah, I'm just gonna suck it up. Now circuit boards are covered with copper and the copper is glued to the fiberglass. And what you wanna do is avoid pulling the copper off. I mean, that's a problem that you have with any, you know, any circuit board, but it's especially bad with surface mount because there's no hole there to hold any of it. So you can actually destroy traces if you're not careful. That's why I'm going slowly with this. I mean, I could just wrench this thing off with the pliers and rip it off, but it would destroy all the traces in the meantime. So by doing it slow and keeping it hot, I'm putting the pressure on the part, not the pad. Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna clean up these contacts with some rubbing alcohol, and then we can proceed to the next step. All right, I've got the connector removed, and it's a pretty small pitch here. On the RAM, it's staggered, see that? Kind of like a video card in your computer. What I think we can do, though, is we can actually use these wider traces here. See how it goes back and forth? We have a via, trace, via, trace, via, trace. So we could actually put thin wires through the vias there, and then I can use my X-Acto knife and just remove the copper here, and that'll be a much easier thing to solder to than these individual pins. All right, I'm getting ready to do the wiring. So I'm gonna orient it like this, and I'll try to keep this as close as possible so the wires are short. And then after I wire, wire everything up, I'll bend it over like a sandwich, like that. And I'll probably put a little bit of metal between these RAM chips and this RAM chip to act as a heatsink. Hopefully keep everything as low as possible so the unit is nice and thin. If I can keep it thinner than these capacitors, that'd be a win. So what I think I'll do actually is grab some blue painter's tape so it stays straight because if it's all loosey-goosey, the wires might not be quite straight when I fold it over and I want it to be as neat as possible. I'm gonna tape it in place and solder it up. I hand wired up the memory expansion but then the system stopped working. I tried it with my bench power supply, with the original power supply, nothing worked. But luckily we found a game store in town, a video game exchange, and they gave us a screaming deal on some more N64s.
All right, here's an older version of the Nintendo 64. Let's see if it works. I'm gonna plug in the power supply. Yay, wave race. So now I have to decide like what I wanna do with this jumper pack. Do I wanna like leave the connector in place or maybe turn the pack at 90 degrees? I mean, I wanna make this the sleekest, sexiest N64 portable ever, but we kind of have this thing sticking out. Of course, you know, we have to have the cartridge someplace as well. So if the cartridge is like here, I mean, it's gonna take up X amount of room in the back anyway. So if we have the memory expansion folded over, it might not be that big of a deal. What people have done is they've taken these packs and cut a slit in them and then bent them over, leaving the copper traces intact on one side, but then making it basically parallel like this. Gosh, I mean, I guess we could give that a shot because rewiring this, seems to be a bridge too far. But you know what we get? We did, we actually got two more RAM expansion packs, so we have plenty of chances to screw this up yet. I've desoldered the metal shroud from the RAM expansion. Now all we have left is the plastic that holds it. I wonder if we, so if we, we can't bend this straight forward because these feet obviously will intersect the circuit board, but if we removed this, I wonder if we could just bend it forward. I wonder if that would work. It might or it could break. <laughs> Those are the two options. Uh, I wonder if I could do that with an X-Acto knife. Don't try this at home. I mean, I guess you could. It's not like I'm doing anything dangerous. It's not like I'm jumping off a cliff. Hey, if I stick in the RAM expansion and bend it, I'll get more leverage. <laughs> Brilliant. That'll help me break it faster. Okay, so the reason this isn't a super great idea is that I could rip up the traces from the PCB, but this is old enough that it's using lead. So there might be enough give that it could work. Hey, let's do this. Let's see if, it, if I broke it yet. <laughs> so we can do it in steps. Screen on. Oh, still works. That's good. Well, should I keep bending? You know what, if we got Beckham in here, he could bend this. So you take a look here, the solder has released, the pins have peeled up. So basically what we did was we pulled loose the solder, but the pins are still connected. Now how well they're connected, that I don't know. Okay, I've bent the RAM expansion all the way over. Will it still work? Screen on. Hey, it still works. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, I think I finally got this memory expansion thing hooked up. So when I bent it over manually, it was still connected, but just barely. So I went in and reflowed all the solder, which took a couple tries, but I believe I have it working. And I also put this piece of copper, which isn't quite in place, but it's pretty decent, between the RAM chips along with some Arctic silver so the heat will transfer into the metal and pull it off of the chips a little bit. So sometimes you have to apply a little pressure to the PCB to make a contact. Let's try it out here. Okay, there it loads up. Oh, wait, we lost it. Okay, so let's apply a little bit of pressure. Try it again. So the pressure isn't making the solder work. It's keeping the pins on the RAM expansion port contacted with the RAM expansion port. These little pins right here, which is kind of like the same problem the old Nintendo had where the cartridge would go in, half the pins sometimes wouldn't connect. Yeah, so what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to hot glue the heck out of these connections here so they can't so they basically, they, so they can't move. And then I can work with this RAM. You know what I could possibly do is um, bolt the copper to the PCB, and then I could use these screw mounts to actually push this down just a little bit so it has constant contact inside of this connector. But it looks like I finally have it working. So in this project, we're gonna need a battery pack, and I've, I'm putting together this little test rig on a PCB here. We're using four lithium ion batteries. We have two batteries in series, and then the two groups of batteries in parallel, uh, 7.4 volts, and there's 3,100 milliamps each. On this board here, I've got these clips to hold the batteries, and then um, right now I have a 3.3 volt regulator. It's a LM256. It's gonna give us 3.3 volts, and we also need 12 volts the 3.3 and the 12 volts are gonna be utilized by the Nintendo. And then we're gonna take the 7.6 volts, uh, 7.4 volts, 7.8 volts, whatever it is, off of the batteries and use that to power the screen. And I just got this 3.3 volt regulator wired up. I'm gonna do a test here. Let's see what we got. Got my multimeter on. Okay, 7.6 volts. My ground, 3.3 volts and zero volts. 
So this regulator is working. Now that I've confirmed that the 3.3 volt regulator is working, I'm going to solder up a 12 volt step up regulator and test that to make sure it works and then pass it on to Ben so that he can integrate it into the project over there. Felix rigged up this battery circuit. So we have four LiPo cells. So we're running them in series and in series and in parallel. That way we have 7.4 volts for the screen, plus we have enough current, hopefully, to run the system. So we knock it down to 3.3 volts, and then we boost it up to 12, and hopefully that'll give us the voltages we need without frying anything. So the 12 volt line is 0.8 amps, which isn't very much. The 3.3 volt line is 2.7, which is a bit more. So I'm actually just gonna take these wires and go directly into this plug. Oh, that would make sense. It's a shared Christopher Walken universe. Yeah. Wasn't he also the same person who gave Adam Sandler the magic remote control? I'll help you get this mouse. All right, let's see if we can do this without blowing anything up. I continue to be amazed at how much people love the N64. I don't know why. Everyone's like, you gotta build a portable of it. And I was like, why? It's like, then finally it's like, fine, I'll do it. Under one condition, we must never speak of it again. Let's see if this will power the N64 or if it'll explode. All right, turn on the screen, turn on the battery pack. I'll see if we can turn on the game. There we go. Yes. I've now hooked up the LCD screen to the 7.6 volt rail. So it'll just use the raw power off the battery. So let's see if that works. Okay, looks like the screen is on. Let's turn on the Nintendo. Cool, all right, so everything's working. So far, we flattened down the RAM so it takes up less space. We've added a heat sink to it. I probably will add a pressure point on it when I build the case to make sure the contacts are intact. Felix built this circuit which takes two pairs of LiPos and knocks it down to 3.3 and boosts it up to 12 volts. And we verified that will run the Nintendo 64. And we also have an idea of how much current this will consume, about two amps, which allows us to figure out how long the batteries will last. One thing that we could do to get a little bit more power is we could remove the CFL, the miniature fluorescent lamp that's in this screen, and replace it with white LEDs which might save us about 400 milliamps. The screen won't look as good, but the power saving could be worth it. Well, that's all the time we have for today. So far in this project, we've rewired the memory expansion at 90 degrees. We've created a 12 volt and three volt circuit to power this using 7.4 volt lithium ion batteries. And we started working on the LCD and doing other tests. All right, so on our next episode, we're going to work on rewiring the cartridge slot at a right angle, attaching the controllers, and also finishing up the battery charging circuit. Have you ever modified a console? Tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Soon we can play Mario 64. <laughs> it's me, Mario. The N64 sucks for hacking. So about halfway there, we're living on a prayer. Take my hand, we'll make it. I swear. Timon, what are you doing? I'm taking over this place. Not so fast. <laughs> we did a banana gun. <laughs> Hold it right there, Simba. What are you doing? I'm a big wuss now. <laughs> That's right, I turned you into a big wimp out in the forest there so I could take over your kingdom. With Scar out of the way, I'm in charge. <laughs> I turned you into Matthew Broderick, the worst fate. <laughs> oh my god! Ah! <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Now you're in Godzilla 98. <laughs> oh, for poop's sake. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.